Hi, everyone, and thank you all for standing by. Welcome to our November webinar entitled Climate Change and Corn Belt Agriculture in the Midwest. These webinars are an initiative of the Ohio State University Climate Change Outreach Team, a multi-departmental effort within the university led by Ohio Sea Grant Office of Research, Ohio Supercomputer OSU Extension, and eight other OSU departments to help localize the climate change issue for Ohioans and Great Lakes residents. I am Jill gentis Benicki from Ohio Sea Grant and Stone Laboratory, and joining me today is Dr. Richard Moore. Dr. Moore is a professor and executive director of the Environmental Sciences Network and the Associate Director of the Office of Energy and the Environment at The Ohio State University. He is on the Executive Committee for the Council of Environmental Deans and Directors of the National Council for Science and the Environment, as well as the lead researcher for Ohio State, part of the USDA $20 million grant, Climate Change Mitigation and Adaptation in Corn-Based Cropping Systems. We also have joining us today Professor Dennis Toddy. Uh, Dr. Toddy is the South Dakota State Climatologist and South Dakota State University Extension Climate Specialist. He is past president of the American Association of State Climatologists and has a background in climatology, meteorology, and agricultural meteorology. He is the co-PI on the USDA Corn and Climate Grant. Uh, we really appreciate both of you coming on today to talk with us about climate change in agriculture. Before we get started, a few logistical issues. During our presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. Afterwards, I will conduct a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during the presentations, please feel free to use the chat feature located on the right-hand side of your screen, and I will collect and pose your questions out to Dr. Moore at the end of his presentation. We have over 100 participants so far on this webinar, a great diverse group representing governmental agencies, academia, and nonprofit groups from the Great Lakes and around the country. Please keep those questions coming throughout the presentation, and we should have a great Q&A session. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted onto our website for later viewing. Also, we will post a webinar survey in our chat feature toward the end of the hour. Please take a few minutes after the webinar to fill out that survey. It will help us continue to bring you better webinars. So without any further delay, I'd like to introduce Dr. Richard Moore from Ohio State University who will present climate change and corn belt agriculture in the Midwest. Dr. Moore, you are unmuted and your presentation is up. Thank you very much. I wanted to thank the OSU Climate Webinar Series. Also, I um, wanted to uh, give acknowledgement and thanks for, for Dennis um, for helping me out here on the, on the climate uh, uh, part of this. Um, also, some acknowledgements uh, to um, uh, people that, are, that have been working on our, our, our large grant. Uh, Lois Morton, who's the lead PI from Iowa State University, and Lori Abendroth, who works with her there. I'd also like to thank Jerry Hatfield for some of his slides uh, that we'll use. He's, with the, he's the head of the new uh, Midwest uh, climate, USDA Climate Hub. And then also my colleagues at Ohio State um, that are working on this grant, Warren Dick, Raton Law, Christy Lakeys, and also thank uh, uh, Tracy Aquara, who's um, with sponsored projects. Um, so let's just uh, dive in. Um, <clears throat> So the topics I want to cover today are, are, are just a little bit about corn, and then Dennis will talk about climate change, um, a, um, also climate change in corn, um, and then he'll hand it back to me, and I'll be talking more about the, the grant, um, then just a couple comments at the end maybe on corn and Lake Erie. Um, for those of you right at the beginning, um, you know, th it's a, a very large grant, a $20 million grant with over 100 um, uh, researchers involved in this. So um, our, our um, information is just starting to come out. We're in year four of a five-year grant, which uh, very likely will have a, a, a one-year extension, uh, year six, um, to, uh, uh, to firm up the database that will be coming out of this. Um, but um, I thought you first want to know that there's a special issue of the Journal of Soil and Water Conservation uh, that just came out. Uh, you can actually uh, get that online right now, and, and uh, while it's still hot off the press, you can actually download the chapters. Uh, so um, it's a great opportunity. 
to get uh, much more data than I'm giving out today. Uh, so there's a number of articles. Almost the whole issue are, are from uh, the researchers, including graduate students that are on this grant. The other uh, great source is to look at the uh, sustainablecorn.org website, which is the website for this grant. Uh, and you can download a number of, of uh, items from that as well. Uh, just some, for ba some background on, on people who may not know much about corn, uh, there's, it's a, a major cereal crop in the United States and uh, worldwide. Uh, if, uh, if you look at caloric intake, um, uh, about 75% of the world caloric intake is from uh, corn, rice, soybeans, and wheat. Um, about 70% of U.S. corn um, is produced in the, in the nine um, Midwest states uh, where uh, we have the, the PIs, uh, the, the, the researchers on this grant. Um, for those of you from Ohio, uh, you can see that um, corn and soybeans are, are um, about equal in value, uh, but uh, you can see the, the $3 billion um, number there. Um, and uh, so these, these go hand in hand uh, in um, very large uh, uh, major crop for, uh, for Ohio itself. Um, crops of the Midwest, uh, you can see that there's a slightly more corn acreage than soybean acreage. Uh, and, uh, but it's also important to realize that we have a lot of other uh, crops, uh, wheat, alfalfa, asparagus, cabbage, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and why this is important, if you look at the market value of these, it's very substantial, 188 um, so, uh, billion. So, so when you get into that and you consider that and also considering the, um, particularly the, the climate change, how it's affecting the West Coast, particularly California, um, this um, has a lot of potential for redefining what agriculture will be in the Midwest. Uh, there's, um, uh, Jerry Hatfield in his presentation uh, to us um, just a couple weeks ago um, was mentioning about uh, this, this very fact. So um, something to keep in mind uh, that there should be a shift uh, that could occur. Great opportunity for the Midwest, put it that way as well. Um, corn production is, is shown here, um, and you can see um, uh, <laughs> where Dennis is from. Um, but um, you can also see uh, where, like Ohio is, as far as the corn that was produced for grain in the year 2012. So this is basically what, the, when we say the Corn Belt, what we're talking about. Um, so it, it stretches across the Midwest. And you can see some of the, the, the big changes that have occurred in, um, in agriculture with regard to corn. If you go back all the way to 1860, and you see the yield in kilograms per hectare, um, um, uh, 2.2 pounds is a kilogram, and, and uh, uh, 2.14, I think, acres is a hectare. Um, the... Um, the um, <clears throat> You can see back in, in 1860, though, that how, what the production was. And all of a sudden, you hit uh, 1940, and then the, the, the corn production starts to go up. And um, Midwest uh, soybean production um, also continues to go up as far as yield uh, fairly constantly. So these are, these are important to remember that um, quite higher yields have occurred uh, in, in corn production. Corn actually comes, uh, was first domesticated in the Valley of Mexico um, from a, a plant called Teosinte. Um, and, you know, another, as we were just referring to the, the high yield increase that's occurred, um, you know, the old varieties of, of corn, um, like the, what the Native Americans grew in North America, was more like 70 to 80 day corn varieties, where today it's common to have 120-day corn. So this is, uh, you know, very important with regard to the, the amount of uh, sunlight that corn receives, and um, this very much affects the yield per acre. It also um, means that we have a longer growing season for that corn, which when we consider the increase in, uh, the dentist will talk about increase in, um, in major um, storm events, uh, this also means that uh, the longer the period, the, the, uh, the higher the probability of, of, of um, uh, having, encountering a, a rain event will occur. Um, so this is the, the Teosinte, a very small um, uh, 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 <clears throat> get 
I'm going to get my laser. <laughs> so teosinte is very small and compared to corn, which is this is the same quarter, very large, uh, very much larger. Uh, so this is what the transition that occurred. Um, the, in the United States, we find that corn and soybeans um, is the major strategy, um, although uh, today we also find no-till soybeans, which actually means minimal till, um, but um, not absolutely no-till. But um, we can see that this uh, corn, soybeans, sometimes an, a, a cover crop or a, um, a, um, maybe something like wheat could be grown in, 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 uh, in a rotation of this. Um, this wasn't always the case. Uh, soybe beca soybeans became popular in the Midwest in the, in the 1960s uh, in particular, and uh, um, Today, you can see the, um, what a, an aerial view, for instance, close to Columbus would look like if you, if you colored the parcels in that were soybeans, um, which are green, and uh, corn, which are golden color here. Um, so um, the Midwest, much of the Midwest actually gets more dense as you go west um, from, from Ohio, uh, but it, looks, it would look something like this. Uh, traditionally, we had uh, the three, the, when, the, when the Native Americans grew uh, corn, they, they called it the three sisters, so they would grow corn, beans, and squash together, which formed a complementary protein. And corn was very important uh, throughout their culture. Um, many uh, leaders were, were named after a corn, like corn stalk, corn planter. Um, and it was also uh, played a prominent role in their um, symbolically in their culture and from their in their religion as well. Okay, I'm going to hand it over to uh, to Dennis at this point to talk a little bit about climate change and the impact for agriculture. Thank you, Richard, and I'd also like to echo the thanks that he had early on to members of of this overall uh, project and to other folks who are doing climate services, other state climatologists. Uh, it, it's it's a very interesting topic because, as we found in some of our work in the project and other associated work, um, there is some misunderstanding about what what is actually happening to climate change and how it's impacting agriculture. Uh, and it is also very interesting as I was looking through Richard's slide, he, he showed you the slide with the trend overall in the way of corn and bean production several slides back, and you've seen a very clear trend what is happening in the way of corn and soybeans but you also saw a lot of variability, and that's part of the weather and climate impact that occurs within agriculture. Uh, we saw that this year with a very good growing season overall where uh, crops, there was very little stress on crops, so yields all across the Corn Belt have been outstanding. In contrast, years like 2012 where we had widespread drought throughout the Corn Belt, we saw large yield reductions and complete crop losses in certain areas. So there is still variability that is impacting what is happening in the way of agriculture. You know, our standard issue related to, to greenhouse gas and what's happening with greenhouse gas is, is, is changing, you know, part of the background of what is happening in the way of, of climate change. Um, that, that are, those are helping to drive overall changes in temperatures across the globe. Uh, and, of course, we are seeing some large changes in temperature across the, the, the Corn Belt, but they're occurring in different ways than people would expect them to. We are seeing overall warming. A, a chunk of that warming is occurring in more wintertime warming, but it's also occurring in the way of uh, our high temperatures, and in, in, in many cases, are not increasing very greatly, but our minimum temperatures, our overnight low temperatures, are increasing more readily. So it's de decreasing our daytime temperature range. And a couple in impacts it's having on us is, uh, 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 Richard also talked about the, the changes in, in corn that we've grown over time and changes in some of the crops. Uh, part of that has been driven by these warmer temperatures are increasing our frost-free season length. And... Um, this, especially the slide, these are both slides from the most recent National Climate Assessment released in the spring. And you can see that, you know, ranging from uh, the eastern corn belts on, on average nine days uh, over the last century and then uh, in the plains up to 10 days, or in some places even more, ranked in the growing season. So that, that's a longer period between average first and first, or average last freeze in the spring and first freeze in the fall. What that does is it allows you to grow. A, a longer variety, and a longer variety typically has more productivity. So that is changing what is happening in the way of, of some of the, the, the corn varieties that we are changing. 
associated with that, along with the warming, one of the probably even bigger changes throughout much of the Corn Belt is the change in precipitation. Uh, we've seen an overall increase in precipitation, more precipitation overall, and precipitation occurring in different times of the year than we had seen, uh, which sometimes doesn't line up very well. Uh, more precipitation in the midsummer is not a bad thing because that is the time when, when crops are most actively growing and need that precipitation. But in, in, in many places across the Corn Belt, we're seeing a shift to more spring or more fall precipitation. And those are typically not times that are, that are as conducive for agriculture. In the spring, you're trying to get into the field and get things planted. And uh, if you have more or wetter fields at that time, you are unable to get in the field or you're doing compaction in the field when you're going through it. If you have increases in fall precipitation, like this happened in the far northwest part of the Corn Belt, you have inability to get in the field and get your harvest out, and then that wetness also carries over until the spring. In addition, that precipitation has been occurring in very heavy events. This is also from the most recent National Climate Assessment. These percentages are increases in the amount of precipitation occurring in very heavy precipitation events. Uh, and that ends up not being useful precipitation because instead of adding to the soil moisture, much of it ends up running off. And when you have intense precipitation events that run off, that water, it goes downstream. It doesn't add to the soil moisture. But also when you have heavy precipitation events, that is going to cause more erosion. And if you do tillage, much tillage at all, and you have heavy rainfall events when there's little to hold that soil, you're seeing large soil loss. And we're seeing that in, in certain areas of, of the corn belt. Uh, those heavy precipitation events have also added to increases in flood magnitude. Uh, this is another slide to the National Climate Assessment. Uh, the triangles, the green triangles, show increasing trends in flooding. The, the larger the, 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 the triangle, the bit more flooding there is occurring. And then a few places we're seeing decreases in flood events. But you can see throughout most of the Corn Belt some large increases in flood events, even bigger ones as we get to the west, far western part of the Corn Belt with certain rivers. Um, at this point, I, I guess I can I can take these next couple slides. Uh, I will also, also apologize. I will not be able to hang around for uh, additional questions afterward. Unfortunately, um, I have to go to another event. But a couple more slides here. Uh, uh, Richard talked about Jerry Hatfield. These are uh, USDA uh, came up or uh, uh, rolled out these climate hubs. Uh, a little over a year ago now, and, and the effort of these is to try to, to do more work and coordinate activities of the federal government, uh, ag experiment stations, uh, cooperative extension, uh, USDA ARS, in efforts in the way of climate research and the impacts on, on agriculture. Originally, they were rolled out as largely climate change centers in agriculture, and there's been a bit of a shift to them now to, to not only talk about climate change, but talk about tools to deal with variability, because in, in a large sense, the, the variability issues are the more day-to-day -day types of things that uh, agricultural producers deal with. And in many cases, uh, that is a way of reducing some of the impact of, of uh, such activities is trying to deal with some of those variability issues. And you can see the, the, the general location of these. Uh, in Ohio, you're sitting as part of the Midwest hub, but adjacent to the Northeast hub and the Southeast hub. These boundaries are a bit fuzzy based on, uh, on, on, on what kind of work you're doing. Um, and, and, you know, this kind of reiterates some of the things that, that I've talked about. You know, some heavier precipitation in the spring is delaying planting and field operations. Obviously, you want to get crops out as early as you can to begin growing. Uh, you know, we've had frequent periods or frequent years where we've been delayed getting crops out, um, and that presents problems with reduced productivity. It also presents problems with people having to, uh, you know, if, the, if they're, delayed too much, they have to change what seed they have to be able to grow at an appropriate time or to have an appropriate growing seed length. Uh, a lot of variability in precipitation during the growing season. Um, some extreme precipitation of, or extreme temperatures. Uh, we did not have these this year. Uh, 2012, we had the extreme temperatures uh, have been reducing uh, yield, especially on the southern end in the Corn Belt. In certain cases, we've had extreme uh, not only heat, but heat and high humidity events that have been impacting livestock production. Uh, in Nebraska, two summers ago, there were uh, one producer lost over 3,000 head of cattle during a high heat humidity event. Um, 
warm temperatures uh, during the winter, causing some some purling breaking of dormancy of, of, of uh, perennial plants. Uh, an example that, that uh, is listed here of, the, of 2012, where we had a very warm winter, tart cherries uh, broke dormancy and started growing earlier uh, than usual in Michigan, much earlier than the, than the average first or, or last freeze. They broke dormancy, freeze hit, and uh, uh, essentially the tart cherry industry was for that year was wiped out. And then we're also seeing expanded ranges and intensity of insects and diseases. Warmer winters allow insects to overwinter further north, and changes in precipitation and amounts of precipitation introduce different disease attitudes. And, uh, you know, this kind of gets at also that idea of, of erosion. These are examples of pictures that Jerry Hatfield had shown of, of erosion losses uh, where you had tilled fields and heavy rainfall, several inch rainfalls on tilled fields, which is obviously a, a loss to the to the to uh, your soil resource and a, a very detrimental thing. Okay, I will hand it now back to Richard and uh, allow you folks with the rest of the session. And thanks for having. Me. Thank you, Dennis. Thanks a lot, Dennis. Um, well, now we're going to shift into uh, the grant itself. Um, so this is a, a very large grant. Uh, uh, that uh, spans all the way from um, Ohio uh, into uh, the area where Dennis was from in South Dakota. Um, and uh, the head of it, uh, the, the center of the grant being in, in, uh, in most PIs, uh, researchers being in, um, in Iowa. Um, and you may be interested in, you know, where, you know, how much does this represent, uh, you know, the, the Corn Belt itself, and you can see the, the varying um, percent of the U.S. total uh, grain harvest um, represented um, here, the corn um, grain harvest. So um, this does actually represent a good uh, chunk of, of grain uh, harvest. Um, one of the things that, you know, that we um, are concerned about are the long-term weather patterns, and, and we know that they're going to be changing. There's great uncertainty and little research regarding how these global climate changes will impact local and regional regional cropping systems. Um, so that was part of the you know the basis for this grant, and uh, we know you know that these things are happening: lo lo longer growing season, shifted frost dates that Dennis talked about, warmer winters. Uh, warmer nights, more frequent severe uh, precipitation events, greater annual stream flows, increased humidity with, within the canopy. Um, and we're talking about canopy here is, is, is like the plant canopy itself. Um, and uh, the um, climate and corn-based cropping system, uh, this is a um, um, called a CAP grant. Um, the vision was to create new science and educational opportunities as a transdisciplinary team. So there's many different disciplines represented, uh, from agronomists to myself. I'm an anthropologist, actually, by training. I do uh, nat uh, um, natural science as well. But um, to um, and also then another part of the vision is to develop science-based knowledge that addresses climate mitigation and adaptation, informs policy development, and guides on-farm watershed level and public decision making in corn based cropping systems. One of the things that really motivated us when we were starting this grant was that, you know, different people were, were trying to get a handle on, on uh, greenhouse gas emissions um, and carbon sequestration, but there was quite a bit of different methodology that was being used. And uh, we, we um, so one of the, the important parts of our grant was then to try to come up with a common methodology to do this acro uh, across the, uh, the corn belt. Um, so we were, um, you know, focusing on on carbon, uh, nitrogen, water, the systems that connect these things uh, from the local field level to the watershed um, and landscape level management, and uh, then we um, wanted to make sure that we could uh, relate our, our research to uh, the farmers themselves and the people uh, in uh, in rural communities and, te and as well as teachers um, at different levels. Um, so our team um, is quite, like I said, quite transdisciplinary, and as you can see, this is a very large project. Um, if you look at the, uh, this was during one of our um, our um, team meetings. We have a team meeting once a year, um, so we have uh, a lot of a lot of people involved. Um, and for that reason, I, I uh, can only I only know some parts of it myself. I don't know all the parts, but here's 140 
person team of scientists, graduate students and topic-based scientists, uh, more than 19 disciplines <laughs> represented. Um, so it's a, it's a very large project. And we have six objectives um, uh, to uh, create the standardized methodology that I was talking about that uh, there's um, you know, so many people have done this, but you know, when you look at the literature, you'll find you know, basically uh, a, a study that was done in, in a, you know, one or a few locations, but using a certain methodology. Then you'll find another, another study that was, that was done maybe on greenhouse gas emissions or carbon sequestration that used a different methodology in a different location. So uh, we wanted to do um, standard methodology across a large number of sites in the Midwest. And then uh, we wanted to evaluate how crop management practices impact carbon, nitrogen, and water footprints at the test sites. And um, then we wanted to apply models to the research data and climate scenarios uh, to identify impacts and outcomes that could affect the sustainability and economic vitality of corn-based cropping systems. So that's one of the parts, you know, right now, I mean, where we are in the grant year four, we're really trying to, to um, you have communication between the uh, the modelers and and uh, people in objectives one and two uh, to uh, firm up the database. It's, the data is still coming in, but it takes researchers a while to you know to um, get the research into a into a database. So um, we're um, working on that. Um, we then um, also wanted to try to uh, objective four to learn about farmers' beliefs and concerns about climate change and um, and have um, um, uh, helping them to uh, to uh, have a better de uh, decision support system uh, so that they can deal with climate change. Then we, um, um, at the same time, uh, need to get the information out and, and have interaction with um, with with the uh, stakeholders, the farmers, and in, in, in uh, rural communities, uh, to so we can get our information out. And uh, then the equally important is uh, the, the graduate students that work on this project that we needed to train uh, this next generation of scientists and um, develop science curricula uh, and uh, promote learning opportunities for high school teachers. So these are uh, the, four, the six uh, um, uh, objectives uh, and uh, sort of interrelated. Um, so diving into the first one, then this is uh, these are some photos from uh, just the methodology section um, and uh, the common methodologies that have been developed, uh, and then at the same time uh, gathering um, you know more uh, more information at the crop level, uh, trying to find out the um, carbon, nitrogen, water footprints at the test sites. So we have these test sites across. Um, you know the Midwest, and the, each of these uh, dots uh, refers to um, the uh, the test site. You, so we have different types of test sites: cor corn soybean rotation, cover crops with a corn soybean rotation, extended crop rotations, organic cropping system, drainage water management, nitrogen fertilizer management, tillage management, landscape position. There's quite a few um, different types of, of experiments going on. The, uh, the stars here represent the, the land, maybe the, the, um, the sites of, of, of where the researchers are located, I think. Um, test plots look something like this. And uh, some of the equipment uh, for uh, greenhouse gas measurements look like that. Um, one of, the th uh, one of the articles that I mentioned at the Special Journal of Soil and Water Conservation, uh, Rattan Law, one of the, uh, the PIs at Ohio, St Ohio State, um, so, you know, just uh, mentioned about President, in, this, in one of his articles, uh, President Obama announced in June 2nd that the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency would cut carbon emissions from the U.S. power sector by up to 30 percent and uh, soot and smog pollution by 25 percent by 2030 relative to the 2005 levels. Um, there will also be an additional water demand of 40% by 2030, in which soil and water storage will play a cu crucial role. Um, so it's really, um, you know, the, the, the importance of, of water uh, in the next um, coming decades uh, is, going to, is going to increase significantly. Um, so um, even in the Midwest where we're, you know, we, we see we have quite abundant uh, Rainfall compared to California, um, we we still uh, it's going to, we're going to be finding that this is a, a precious um, a commodity. The um, 
there's some hope, of course, with the recent signing of an agreement between uh, China and the United States, um, so we're hoping for the best. Uh, here's one of our researchers from Lincoln University, uh, uh, Naslambi, out in the field doing uh, collecting uh, perhaps um, insect, um, I'm not sure exactly what that is, probably that. Um, here's a, an example of research uh, by Warren Dick at Ohio State University. One of the things that we have in this uh, grant is uh, back in the early 1960s, um, we, uh, we have a, a, a continuous uh, corn soybean uh, rotation, long-term no-till, uh, up at um, um, what's called OARDC, the Ohio Agricultural um, um, <coughs> Research and Development uh, Center. And uh, Warren um, is in charge of this long-term no-till plot. So uh, we have done various uh, uh, measurements on these, um, on these, these sites. So one of the things that Warren did, uh, for example, a recent research had to do with methane, um, which is a, a, a very potent greenhouse gas uh, found at lower concentrations in the, at the atmosphere than actually more than uh, carbon dioxide. However, methane's global warming potential is 23 times greater than uh, carbon dioxide. So one of the things he looked at were these methane oxidizing bacteria. Um, that are present in aerobic so soils, and uh, you know the, the, the question of oxidizing methane and, and use it. At the, the, these uh, bacteria um, oxidize methane and use it as a sole source of carbon and energy. Um, and this can be a um, uh, biological uh, sink for atmospheric methane. So um, one of the questions then is, you know, what's the effect of tillage? Is it do, the, do these increase or decrease depending on how much you till the soil? So the hypothesis was that there'd be a variation in methane oxidation rates in soils under different land use practices. Um, that's indicative of methane oxidizing bacterial diversity in those soils. And in the conclusion, they found that uh, long-term no-tillage soils have higher uh, methane oxidation rates than tilled soils in our sink for this greenhouse gas. Um, <clears throat> Uh, we also have another uh, other research going on besides uh, research of, of uh, Raton Law, who focuses on soil se uh, on carbon sequestration, um, and um, um, Warren Dick is, is Norm Fossey, who's with the USDA um, Agricultural Research uh, Service, and um, he's been focusing on drainage, uh, so um, things like um, different types of drainage, controlled drainage um, at uh, different sites. Um, in an article that he and Rattan Law and, and uh, some of Rattan's uh, students uh, published in that uh, journal, uh, the 2014 special issue, said in general plots under no-till with subsurface drainage produce lower uh, uh, greenhouse emissions, uh, greenhouse gas emissions compared to those under chisel till. Uh, subsurface drainage lowered the emissions compared to those under no drainage. Uh, results from this study concluded that subsurface drainage in poorly drained soils with long-term no-till practice can be beneficial for the environment by, lowering, by emitting lower greenhouse gas fluxes compared to tilled soils with no drainage. So that's just another you know, example of the kind of, of uh, research that's ongoing. We're also then, uh, a lot of focus has been going on uh, currently to try to create a really good database that can uh, be a legacy of this project. Uh, to, uh, to go into the future. So we have it organized under um, you know, site, the sites that, that you saw that are across the Midwest where we have the same kind of methodologies for uh, greenhouse gases and carbon sequestration measurements as well as um, then the, uh, the, we have this organized by watersheds as well. Um, So you know, one of the things then with with that database then uh, comes in the ability to be able to do some predictive uh, you know, analysis and predictive modeling. And I won't go into detail about that, but um, the whole team is there. Um, that's one of the things we're you know really focusing on because we think that'll be a legacy of the project. When maybe 50 years from now or you know 20, 50 years from now, people will be able to come back and. Um, realize at a time when people were starting to wake up about climate change that you know we did these measurements across the um, uh, across the Midwest and um, 
hopefully by then they'll be able to see some changes and um, now that we have, now that we'll have created a sort of a benchmark um, <clears throat> social and economic research is a fourth objective uh, gain knowledge of farmers beliefs and concerns about climate change um, uh, attitudes towards adaptation mitigative strategies uh, etc uh, and <clears throat> so uh, statistically uh, we uh, surveyed uh, about um, um, a subset of, of the 20,000 farmers in 22 um, um, hydrologic uh, uh, level six-digit watersheds in the upper Midwest and uh, we did this in cooperation with another uh, research project which is called uh, U2U. So this is the area um, and the watersheds across the Midwest that we uh, looked at for this uh, survey that was done in the year 2012. And this is some examples of outputs of this. And you can download from our uh, sustainablecorn.org site the uh, statistical atlas. And you can, it's, it's, uh, this is like map 32, so you can see there's a lot of maps here. But um, you can get an idea just by the color. The, the darker the color means the higher percent. And the question that was asked to the farmers um, was experienced significant problems with saturated soils or ponding over the over the past five years, which was 2007 to 2011. So you can see, um, well, Northwest Ohio up in the Maumee area there on a corner of Lake Erie, they scored pretty high. Um, I don't know, it looks like it's in the 80 or almost 90 percent. So um, quite a bit of, of, of that in that particular um, uh, survey, high um, um, uh, recognition about the, uh, the problem of saturate, saturated soils. The same thing about rain itself, uh, the question um, more frequent extreme rain, so uh, percent concerned or very concerned. Well, I think that uh, we in Ohio, actually Northwest Ohio, scored highest on that one. Um, so you can get an idea, and here's the, uh, you can see the, it's quite a, a large joint uh, project, um, and uh, uh, many people were, were helping out on that. Um, and then uh, one of our researchers, Jay Arbuckle, who's uh, you know um, key individual in, le in leading um, this uh, objective, um, also um, had done some research about um, concerns about excess water issues, percent concerned or very concerned. So, um, and this was then done according to whether um, in his survey people thought climate change was occurring and whether they thought it was mostly human causes um, or maybe they thought it was climate change was occurring caused by equally natural and human causes or mostly natural causes or insufficient evidence and so on um, or climate change is not occurring at all and so um, then looking at which group um, saw you know that they thought more uh, frequent extreme rains uh, they were concerned about it and you can see then the people that were um, climate change was occurring caused mostly by humans which we know that to be the fact um, is um, scored highest on, on the rain. And um, <clears throat> same thing here on uh, su support for collective and individual mitigation, doing something about the problem. And of course this group uh, that uh, thought climate change was occurring, caused mostly by humans, uh, scored, um, scored highest. Uh, government should do more. Um, I should do something about it. Uh, so on both those. Um, one of the things that, that I was interested in um, was the high percentage in that study. There was a very high percentage of, of people who were um, uncertain. Um, and um, so um, there was a question that one of the possible answers was that there was insufficient evidence to know why, uh, what, to know with certainty whether climate change is occurring or not. And when we see this uh, study f that was done in the Corn Belt, you can see then that pretty common to find in the 30 percent that there's this many people, 30 some percent of the farmers were responding that they were insufficient evidence. So we decided to do this over in an area where I do a lot of research called the Sugar Creek Watershed, um, which in the Amish actually scored 83 percent of insufficient evidence. So this is in, also in the year 2012 using the same survey. Um, for non-Amish in the watershed, it was something like the rest of the Corn Belt, maybe a little bit higher, but uh, pretty similar. So that really um, uh, sparked my interest. <laughs> Just like, why, why would the Amish, so many say, 83% uh, 83, 83% of them say that there was insufficient evidence. And um, so we, we um, 
And here's just a com comparison of here's the, the survey um, that was done in the Corn Belt, and then you compare our study to 83%. Um, and the non-Amish, you know, in the Sugar Creek watershed uh, or something like that, not, not a whole lot, you know, um, you know this, these numbers are a little bit lower, but uh, no, this number was lower, but um, not, not, not so far off, really. This one really stuck at, uh, stood out. Um, so we were interested, and so I have some summer interns that, uh, that, were, um, that have uh, their summer uh, job uh, associated with this. So we um, uh, wanted to ask then um, why this is. And so our, you know, our hypothesis that students had was that uh, perhaps people were saying insufficient data, but uh, maybe they had a lot of sufficient, specific reasons for it. Um, and these were probably, knowing farmers, probably based on their own farming experience and their own local, local situation. So we, uh, uh, this last um, summer, we um, did a, a survey at the, the Amish Family Farm Day in Dundee. Um, and then we also uh, um, took a, a subset of, of people from the Sugar Creek watershed that were, that were not at that. Um, and we, we were focusing then on, well, what kind of stories, that, that winter, we had a very cold winter, and so we started focusing on, well, what, what, what would people tell us if we started asking them about what you do, um, you know, to get yourself through that winter, um, and did you have any unique stories? And there were a lot of stories. People, farmers could come up with all sorts of things, you know, keeping animals in the barn, feeding them more, blocking up windows, thawing pipes with hair dryers, waiting uh, to plant uh, in the spring. Um, because it was too cold, or wrapping the, the, the barn or beehives in plastic, black cardboard, or tarp, uh, using feed bags for insulation. So, so there were quite a, quite a number of stories that came up. And we also then uh, um, asked, this, uh, asked the same question, you know, is, there, is, cl is climate change occurring? Well, we know that, that more flooding is occurring, more, you know. So what would they, how would they answer that? Well, in this case, then, the Amish actually, um, uh, we, you know, our, our number, our, our N is very low in the survey, but um, we found that uh, they, they, they scored it quite differently than the other survey. So if you ask the question in a different way, it seems uh, based on their own experience, they may uh, be able to actually associate um, their own experience with um, things that, that we know are closely associated with climate change. Um, another objective in the in the grant is extension, uh, and uh, so we try to uh, get the word out about what our findings are to the local um, people. Here's uh, um, Chad from Iowa State um, talking to a farmer. We also have uh, education um, that we try to train this uh, the graduate students and uh, develop educational curricula. Um, one course that I teach is at Stone Lab uh, in the summertime. Uh, we'll be teaching it again this summer, I, I'm, I'm hopeful. Um, and we um, associate this with the algal bloom, uh, corn being a major crop, and so the high nitrates coming and phosphorus coming off of the, uh, off of the corn uh, crop. And we have the, have the students uh, um, talk to the farmers and local watershed coordinators and actually um, go out in the stream and look at the quality of the streams and, and then go out and um, actually in Lake Erie and we measure the, um, the algal bloom. This is at uh, Stone Lab. Um, so, um, yeah, like I said, we'll be teaching it again this summer. So this last summer we had a, a lot of uh, students from the grant. It was a, really a number of grad students that were in the course. It was a, it was a, had a great time. Um, one other thing we've done in education is we've tried to connect uh, nationally. You know, we're, we work in the area of agriculture, but it's important to get outside of that area um, from just our own grant, work with others that are doing work in agriculture on, on climate change, but also connect to uh, the larger audience of science and the environment. And um, this, uh, this group, National Council for Science and the Environment, has a, 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 a project called uh, CAMEL Project. And, um, you can see the, uh, the the URL down below it, and and so we're trying. They're uh, posting some of our speed science videos that come out of this uh, project. So if you go to our website on sustainablecorn.org, uh, you can um, download um, uh, speed science videos. These are very short videos for the, um, uh, for anyone. I, I get a lot out of them. I learned because, like I said, there's so many researchers in this project that you can just watch these videos and and uh, learn a lot. But we've uh, teamed up with them, and, and it's been a, a very successful um, um, teamwork that we're getting. 
So there's this many grad students each year. You can see there's a lot of them uh, at the annual meetings. Uh, we try to work uh, some with undergraduates as well, though our focus is on graduate students. And Iowa State University and Lincoln University have climate camps. Um, last, uh, but not least, I mean, it's just some things I think to think about um, when we think about Lake Erie and corn. And we have a rising temperature and the increasing growing season lengths and greater variability of temperature, higher nighttime lows, extreme swings over short time periods, uh, periods of extreme heat, cold, and timing of frost events. And I guess one thing that I really want to emphasize is, you know, with regard to, you know, to like to, to Lake Erie, um, there's some other things like to cha uh, changes of pa uh, participation, uh, precipitation patterns. Some places are going to be drier, others wetting. Much more, um, you know, um, less predictability. Decreased snowfall. Uh, of course, that'll affect. Um, Sometimes there's manure that's uh, from farms that's placed on snow, and that's you know, it's not a it's, they're trying to um, decrease that from happening. Um, but um, greater variability of precipitation, more short, intense events, shifting of shifting of timing um, of the events, uh, more. Um, uh, Dennis had mentioned about the spring, um, yes, more more spring um, uh, rain events, and these are more severe rain events. Um, so, or, or weather events. Um, so, one of the things that it's really important with regard to things like algal bloom, trying to prevent the algal bloom in Lake Erie, you know, this increase in rain events is in. in you know, first of all, I mean, they, if you think about, there's been some studies done that show that about 80 to 90 percent of the nutrient loss for phosphorus and nitrogen occurs during these major rain events. So, um, and this is too often forgotten, I think, in, in the discussions and. You know, um, and we also find that you know it's not just you, know, you need nitrogen and phosphorus for the algal bloom, but but also soil erosion itself. I mean, one of the problems in Sandusky Bay, uh, I'm sorry, and, well, as in, in particular, um, Maumee Bay um, is is sediment uh, uh, deposition by that, that occurs from you know rain events from ag going um, into into rivers that end up in in the uh, in the Maumee Bay. So um, the, the focus really needs to, to be focused, on, you know, centered on what conservation measures can we put in during that would relate specifically to these high uh, uh, rain weather events. Um, it's very hard, to, you know, for us, and it's one of the things that's difficult in monitoring during rain events. If you ever try to go out during a major storm and it's flooding, you know, you don't want to send your workers and uh, technicians into, into a, a dangerous situation. And it's also difficult to know, like, where do you measure exactly during a, uh, a major rain event where, like, maybe it's, there's flooding occurring. Um, do you do it in the, where the stream was or do you do it where it overflowed onto the land? So on. Well, I mean, there's a lot of methodology and hyd hydrology about this kind of thing, but still, it's, 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 uh, Something we know less about than we know about um, uh, during um, during low flow. So um, with that, um, um, we need to be more flexible of production. We need to have, think about more varieties, shorter season varieties, uh, different crops. Um, this opportunity um, for the Midwest will also, as, as Jerry Hatfield had emphasized. Be, uh, be happening because of California uh, and the problems with uh, drought there. So it presents a real opportunity for the Midwest. Um, cover crops, uh, less tillage equals less greenhouse gases. Um, so trying to get more cover crops into, into a rotation of corn and soybeans. This no-till um, uh, that, uh, that uh, Rattan Lal and Warren Dick and, and Norm Fozzie have been advocating. Um, less greenhouse, it means less greenhouse gases. Um, build a resilient system to withstand the increased number and intensity of weather events is what we need to do. Well, with that, uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Moore. Um, we have gotten some great questions, so let me, um, let me see how many we can ask Dr. Moore. Um, what questions uh, we don't have, we'll try to see if we can post later on uh, our site. Uh, okay, so Dr. Moore, this is a question specifically about slide 50. So I don't know if um, you would like to go to slide 50. Um, how does this research affect things like drainage tiles in the mommy watershed? I know there's been questions about that practice related to environmental issues.
You said, how does this relate to the drainage tiles in the Mami Basin? Yeah, yeah. So how does this uh, research affect things like dra drainage tiles in the Mami watershed area? Um, well, we do know, I mean, like one of the response by the farmers on drainage tiles right now is putting in more drainage tile and um, and clo and they've 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 actually um, have the space between the drainage tiles has been be becoming a little bit less. Um, there's quite a, um, a waiting list, uh, from what I hear, of people that, for farmers who you know want to put in drainage tiles. It's quite in demand right now. So that's been one of the responses by the farmers. Um, now, um, with respect to the research itself, uh, there's been um, I'm not an, an expert at this, but there's um, People like Norm Fozzi that I would advise the person uh, that asked the question to, you know, just ask, you know, talk to Norm Fozzi directly um, about this um, if they have specific questions. Uh, one of the, um, and there's also um, Kevin King is another researcher that works, you know, um, with the Agricultural Research Service at Ohio State, um, who's done a lot of work on on this kind of, of uh, thing, but. Um, there's a, one of the issues, there's a number of issues involved with, with this. And, and no, when you have no-till, then you may have more, um, more wormholes, for, in, for instance, that so when, it, when you have um, uh, a, lar a, a heavy rain, then, then it may get more um, um, connectivity uh, from the surface down to the drain tiles themselves. So that's one of the, the issues with, um, with drain tiles. But, um, Controlling um, so that there's efforts being made then to to put a kind of of uh, controlled drainage uh, in as well that we're particularly on 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 fairly level land um, then to have some some ma some measure of of controlling how much water flows through um, so you can you can then hold some water back um, to keep your soil more moist during uh, the uh, non-rain after the rain event, but um, but also uh, be able to filter some of the uh, of the nutrients um, at that point, uh, putting it into a controlled drainage type of, of situation. I don't know if that answers what the what the person's looking at, but um, so this um, no-till with some kind of su subsurface drainage does produce lower um, uh, greenhouse um, gas emissions. Thank you, Dr. Moore. Uh, another question that we had was uh, dealing with uh, slide 56. Uh, and the question is, does ponding and saturation also have to do with different soil types, or are they all pretty comparable? Um, yes, um, definitely. Um, um, different soil types affect um, uh, the the um, how much water would be ponding, um, you know, or drain off, um, and that would vary across the across the the corn belt. I guess that, that maybe that's all I can say. So yes, definitely the the soil type is a factor, and, and actually there's I mean even within let's just say on that particular slide I mean Northwest Ohio there's there's actually many many soil types up there, um, um, so. I mean that was actually one of the reasons um, for the the rapid adoption of Roundup Ready soybeans uh, in Northwest Ohio. I gave a um, a um, Monsanto asked me back uh, when I first um, became in. I have part of my appointment is with Extension, and, and um, this was around the year 19. It was in the, in the anyway the 1990s, um, and um, I went to their field day, and, and so I asked. Um, I noticed that there was a very high adoption rate of, of Roundup Ready uh, soybeans in that area, and um, the I wondered why it was so high, even relative to at that time Indiana. Um, and they said uh, it was because of the different soil types that there were so many different weed types, and so Roundup Ready, um, which means I don't know, for those of you that don't know, it's a it's a, a um, transgenic um, 
GMO uh, soybean um, that then you can spray the the, um, the herbicide Roundup on it, but the plant survives and the weeds die. Um, and so that was one of the reasons why it was it was uh, widely adopted in Northwest Ohio because there were a lot of soil. Okay, thank you, Dr. Moore. Uh, we had a, a couple questions dealing with the um, farmer surveys. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about what you hope to do with the the, the input from the farmer survey results? Are you refer are you referring to the Amish part or? I'm not completely sure. Um, I'm not sure which slide it was. So we hope maybe if you could do both. Well, um, well, as far as the, the survey itself, you can you can download the survey from um, right off of the of the sustainablecorn.org website. Um, the uh, the statistical survey. Um, there's some there's quite a bit of interest actually uh, to do this kind of survey in other areas and in uh j r buckle uh um, who is uh, one of the leaders of this uh um and also um working with u to u um they um they are interested in in extending this to other other areas um other even other commodities and other um, aspects of agriculture try to do a similar kind of, of, of study in that same area. Um, I know that the uh, the USDA Climate Hub, uh, which Jerry Hatfield was interested in 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 doing this. I think Jay Arbuckle, if any was anybody's really interested, contact Jay and he could probably update you on it. But I think they're in the process of doing that. Um, it's also an interesting benchmark in the sense of you know how would it change like if you did it in, you know the same study in another ten years because it was done using the uh, USDA um, uh, statistical um, um, agricultural services database so they did have a, a statistical uh, sample of this region so it's a it's a very good study um, uh, and statistically solid so um, it'd be nice to do a study a follow-up study in about ten years see where the people are. But you know, as far as my work uh, with the Amish, we you know we hope to publish an article about it. Um, our you know our, our one of the problems is our our number is very small, um, so um, it would be more a, sort of a qualitative study in the sense of some of the things that we found. So a lot of it you know from a social science point of view depends on the questions you ask, and you know what we what you know like I said what sparked our interest was just the high number of insufficient data responses that we had you know that we saw in the in the uh, the survey across the Midwest which made me wonder like why so many people were putting insufficient data because they probably had good reason for it but what would why, why would a third of them be, be doing that um, and and so then we we thought well knowing farmers would they probably have some kind of, of, of reason for it um, grounded in their own experience and um, we found them very able to then to, to come up with their own own you know experiences. Uh, so yeah, we'll we'll uh, be writing an article about that, uh, more like I said, more qualitative. Um, I should maybe talk to Jay about it, see if we can maybe make it um, work it into a more of a of a large large scale study. Uh, Dr. Moore, one follow up with um, uh, the Amish uh, survey. One one of our attendees was asking about the insufficient evidence. If that in the Amish population possibly means not enough exposure to media or other outlets, just wondering about the exposure to information related to climate change when we're talking about the Amish population. Well, I mean that we did we did find this that you know that when in 2012 when we when we first did that survey. There was quite a pushback. Um, I've done a lot of studies with with Amish, um, and we're very accepted. I, I um, um, very successful projects working with Amish. Um, this one, there was a lot of pushback. And when we went out, you know, door to door, we usually do the, the our survey technique. Normally, is is we we uh, knock on doors and you know give them a survey, even get even do it with them right there, or come back in a day and and, and pick it up. Um, there was pushback on this one, and. Um, we think that that was probably because, um, you know, this, this actually when you talk about um, long-term climate change and talk about, you know, the, the planet Earth and, 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 you know, you have to think about um, 
you know, millennia um, in, um, you know, greenhouse gases and carbon sequestration over long periods of time, then you, then you do brush up against the, the geologic time periods where Amish, you know, believe that, you know, the Earth was, you know, created in uh, 4004 B.C. or something like that. So, so um, that could be part of it. Uh, we never actually went there with them about that as far as, like, to trying to, to, to understand more about that because we, did, we knew it was a sensitive issue. Um, but um, now we're finding, I mean, at least that the, they are able to, I mean, find a number of Amish that were very much... Um, you know, on top of it, as far as being able to get media, actually, Amish, you'd be really surprised. They're on pretty much on top of. They get the you know, like newspaper, they read you know, all the time, and so um, they they actually get uh, pretty good information. Okay, thank you, Dr. Moore. Uh, we are at one o'clock, so uh, we will hold any of the other questions. Uh, for possibly, uh, Dr. Moore, I may relay a few of these to you uh, later for some answers. Uh, but I did want to, again, thank you, Dr. Moore and Dr. Uh, Toddy, for their willingness to talk to us today about their work. It re was really an excellent discussion. I also wanted to thank uh, Ohio State University National Sea Grant College Program and Ohio Supercomputer for funding this webinar. What, wanted to remind everyone that our survey URL for this webinar is in the chat feature, so please take a few minutes to fill that out. I also wanted to refer you to resources and an archive of all previous webinar presentations which are located on our changingclimate.osu.edu website. This webinar series is sponsored by the OSU Climate Change Outreach Team and will continue next month. We'll email everyone when it's available to register. Thank you again, Dr. Moore, and all participants on this webinar. We hope this was beneficial and hope you'll join us again in an upcoming webinar. Thank you and have a great afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Moore. Thank you. Thank you.